just to just to uh, to outline how the meeting work, how the session will work, um, we'll I'll be putting a number of questions to David um, for the around the first half, thirty to thirty five minutes, and then for the remainder of the event, we will open it up to the to you, the audience, to put questions to David. And just so you know, the first half of the discussion uh, the discussion between David and me will be recorded. Um, can I ask you just to make sure that your microphone is switched off when you're if you're not speaking, and please use the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen rather than the chat function to submit questions throughout the session and we'll be sort of keeping an eye on those. Um, when we do get to, to the Q&A session we'll invite you to pose your question directly to David and when you do we just ask if you could briefly introduce yourself and tell us your affiliation. Okay, so let me introduce our guest, uh, David O'Sullivan, who very modestly described himself on his Twitter profile as a former EU public servant. He's actually had an extensive career uh, within the European Union. He joined the European Commission in 1979, and by 2000, he had reached the, uh, the, the level of Se Secretary General of the European Commission, the most senior official within the administrative structures. He also served as Director General in the DG Trade and as Director General in DG Relex, which is the external relations part of the Commission. And as such, he was responsible for helping to establish the brand new European External Action Service, essentially the EU's foreign ministry. And he served as its chief operating officer between 2010 and 2014. His final job uh, for the European Union was as the EU ambassador to the United States from 2014 to 2019. So he has an extensive diplomatic career and will have lots and lots of experience and, and I'm sure insights and anecdotes uh, to share with us about his time there. And today, David is a senior counsellor at the international law firm of Steptoe. David, a very warm welcome. Thank you for being with us this evening. Okay. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, just very briefly to ask you if you could give us a little bit of detail about how you started on your diplomatic career. I know many of our audience will be students at UCL and may be considering something similar. So perhaps you could say a, a few words about how you got started and how you rose to the, uh, to the, to, to the level that you did. Well, seren serendipity played a, an enormous role, as it always does, I think, in, in life. Um, I'm a great believer in John Lennon's dictum that um, life is what happens to you when you're making other plans. Um, I studied uh, economics at, at university in Dublin. Then I went to the College of Europe uh, for a year uh, to study European studies. Um, Ireland in the early 1970s, to be honest with you, was not a very exciting place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't offer many job opportunities. You were either, it was either the public service or basically go to the UK to work in industry. And I was not particularly enthused by that prospect. So I joined the Irish uh, civil service. Um, I actually started in the Department of Agriculture, something which I think both myself and the Department of Agriculture have airbrushed out of our respective CP. Um, uh, and uh, a year later, I moved to the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Foreign Ministry. Um, where I, I was, where I worked for, for two and a half, three years. Um, in the meantime, I was kind of doing um, concours for the, for the European Union. I mean, it wasn't that I desperately wanted to spend all of my life working for the European Union, which in the end I, I ended up doing. It was more that I, I, I kind of wanted some experience outside of Ireland. Uh, I think if the Irish Foreign Ministry had actually offered me a posting you know, in some foreign country before I got a job offer with the commission, I probably would have taken it, but they, they didn't. And in the end, I was offered a job in Brussels. And like many people, I said, well, I'll go there for two years uh, uh, to get the experience. So then I'll return to the Irish foreign ministry. Uh, then, as I say, serendipity and John Lennon's, uh, you know, life story. Um, I, I was 18 months, two years in, in Brussels when I was asked would I would go to Japan. Uh, to join the EU, the Commission delegation, uh, which was being strengthened because of the trade friction with Japan. So I spent four years there, uh, very formative years of my life, I must say. Um, then I came back to Brussels to join the, the um, private office of Peter Sutherland, who was then the Irish Commissioner. And then, frankly, one thing led to another, and you know, I ended up spent making my career in Brussels, and uh, I, I, I. I don't think of it as a classical diplomatic career because basically I became an, an EU uh, public servant dealing with uh, um, education, training, social policy, 
uh, finally, um, uh, you know, rising through the ranks, becoming a director general. Actually, my first job was as director general was education and training. I spent a lot of time in education and training, working with Erasmus Comet. Uh, then became chief of staff to Romano Prodi when he became the president, became secretary general, then went on to GT Trade. Uh, moved to help set up the external action service, which was kind of a return to diplomacy, uh, and then ended my career as ambassador in, in Washington. So finally, finally making it to the summit of the diplomatic uh, uh, career, but it was it was kind of not what I had started out with or or, or, or particularly planned. So you know, um, that's that's how these things work out uh, sometimes. You know. And just very briefly, if you had any advice for someone thinking of pursuing a career in the in, in the EU institutions, what would you say to them? Well, I'm afraid my, my, my first advice is always rather pessimistic. It's saying have a plan B, because uh, trying to get a job in the EU institutions is rather like buying a lot of tickets. Uh, you know, I, I, when I when I sat the, the competition for the European Commission in 1978, 70, 78, I think we were 6,000 candidates for 150 jobs. Um, the last concours I looked at was 70,000 candidates for 100 jobs. So you know, the, the odds have considerably lengthened on your, you know, you're getting through the process. Uh, so I think it's good to have, you know, to have other ideas about what you can do with your life and to keep sitting in the concours and keep trying to see if, you, if you're really committed to doing it. I think people will eventually find their way through, but it's uh it's it's not simple uh, the, there's a lot of competition for a relatively limited number of places and frankly some fantastically qualified people you know so it's a very competitive environment brilliant well, well thank you for that so let's then let's turn to the substantive topic which is foreign policy and and, and how the eu does does it um, and i just like to start if i may briefly kind of to, to sort of draw out some of the experiences you obviously had in sort of, sort of 2010 onwards so we had the the lisbon treaty which some of you may be familiar with which came into force in 2009 brought some very far-reaching changes to how the eu and its member states conduct foreign policy so there was a strengthened role for the high representative, the kind of, you like the, 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 the chief diplomat or sort of quote unquote foreign minister of the EU. And there was also this, the creation of this external action service, which is ostensibly a kind of a kind of a, a foreign minister for the ministry for the EU. Um, to what extent have these reforms been successful, would you say, and what still needs to be done to strengthen the EU's foreign uh, foreign policy capacities? Well, I, I, I think... If I may, Nick, I'd like to go back a bit further to my early days in the Irish Foreign Ministry, because I think we, it's, it's very important to understand just how far we have come with the development of a common uh, European foreign and, and security policy. Um, back in the days of the 1970s, we had something called European political cooperation, which was parallel to the European economic community. And member states were very anxious that this was kept separate. Meetings could not be held in Brussels. They had to be held in the capital of the member state holding the presidency. The commission was not automatically invited, uh, was sometimes invited. And I can remember as a commission official, because I was dealing with um, uh, the Soviet Union and uh, state trading countries, being invited to several meetings, but where I was told, okay, you sit outside the door, we invite you in for agenda item five and when agenda item five is left is finished you will leave uh, and when i was in the irish foreign ministry uh, the, the the main purpose of coordination was to try and get all member states voting in the same way at the united nations and that was the that was the height of our ambition <laughs> so i mean we now you know we have come such a long way and now voting at the united nations it's routine that we all vote in the same way and not just the 27 members of the, of the European Union, but also the candidate countries, uh, associated countries. So the EU and friends delivers probably, you know, 35, 36, 37 votes uh, at the United Nations systematically. Um, the creation of the European External Action Service and the creation of the post of high representative vice president of the commission uh, grew out of the uh, situation which arose in, in 1999, Javier Solana was appointed as a high representative for uh, security, common security and foreign policy. Uh, it was a post, he was simultaneously Secretary General of the Council. Uh, and 
Uh, bureaucracy grew up in and around what Xavier Solana was doing in the Council Secretariat, so not in the Commission. Uh, the military staff of the Western European Union, which had been wound down, were transferred to the Council uh, of Council Secretariat. Uh, and Javier uh, did fantastic work creating uh, a bureaucracy which could create military missions and civilian missions. But many people were getting worried that this was kind of turning into two competing bureaucracies in the Council Secretariat and in the Commission, which also substantively dealt with uh, many foreign policy issues. Chris Patton was the uh, Commissioner for External Relations, and Chris used to say, uh, this works because I'm content to let Xavier be the front office and I'm the back office. Uh, but many people thought yeah, it actually doesn't work that well, so we need to merge these two people together. And in fact, in the um, Constitutional Convention, which is where this idea emerged, uh, the merged person who would bring together these two roles, High Representative and uh, Commissioner for External Relations, uh, was actually called a Foreign Minister. Um, and it was also agreed that the, the bureaucracy should be merged, which would then be the uh, European External Action Service. This was all in the Constitutional Convention, which, as we know, was then uh, voted down, firstly by a referendum in France, then by a referendum in the Netherlands, uh, and was completely shelved until reimagined in the Lisbon Treaty. Um, some people thought that the defeat in France was because we had a foreign minister, so they thought we had to find, change the title. So we, we ended up calling the person the High Representative Vice President not exactly a, a catchphrase or something that the people of Europe can easily identify with, but apparently this was considered an important change. Uh, and then we had the, the creation of the service. I, I think the important thing to say is this is changing the mechanics. Uh, it's not changing the substance. It's, it's, a, it's an instrument. Uh, it is merging uh, the, the roles into one person in the hope that that creates more consistency. It's bringing the bureaucracy together to try and get more of a, a common sense of purpose. Um, and I think it has been relatively successful, particularly that one of the biggest changes was to change the commission delegations into EU delegations. So where previously there was a commission office in, in third countries, but the chairmanship and the speaking on behalf of the EU was undertaken by the country holding the rotating presidency. Uh, under the uh, Lisbon Treaty, this now passed to the External Action Service, to an EU ambassador, uh, and that has worked very, very well. I think in, 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 in the delegations, it's worked well. In Brussels, we had a lot of problems bringing together all these different elements of, of you know, bureaucracy, including one third of the staff who had to come from member states, so we had to integrate them. Uh, I think that's taken a little longer. I think it's now working much better. But the point is, this is a vehicle. It is not in itself uh, the, the person, who, the, the machine that delivers the policy. Uh, and we still have the fundamental problem that member states are reluctant uh, on many occasions to have a common policy. And we still need to proceed by unanimity, which limits, of course, the ability uh, to uh, agree difficult positions in, in complicated situations. And just as far as the role of the member states is concerned, is it as simple as saying that smaller member states are happy to allow a kind of a, a collective kind of EAS driven voice, whereas the larger member states are a bit more wary or is it more complicated than that? No, no, no. I, one of the problems is that I think even the smallest member states think that their, their views on foreign policy are very important. So I think the, the idea that it's only the big member states, of course, the big member states have a greater variety of of. Uh, interest in, in foreign policy. Smaller countries tend to have a more limited spectrum of, of issues that are really important to them. Uh, but all member states still see foreign policy as a very important element of sovereignty. Uh, and they are all very reluctant uh, to see that completely taken over by uh, you know, a European level uh, action. So it's still quite complicated to, to get uh, agreement. Uh, I think one of, one of the consequences of Brexit, which I know you want to come to later, but is that when we had the UK in the European Union, the triangulation between Germany, France and the UK was pretty good because if those three could agree on something, 
I really think that nearly all our mem other member states could find themselves inside that triangle, maybe a little bit closer to the British or the French or the German position, but they could find themselves. The departure of the UK means we're missing a, an element of that triangle and we haven't yet decided whether it's replaced by a triangle, by a quadrangle or by a, a pentangle uh, and how that's going to work. And I think that that is one of, for me, one of the great losses of, of, of Brexit. Well, if we can turn now then to some of the sort of substantive issues that the that European foreign policy, EU foreign policy faces, I mean, what would you say are some of the immediate and longer term foreign policy challenges that the EU and its member states have to address? Well, I mean, the, the list is long, unfortunately. Um, I, for me, I think the area where we need most attention is what I would call our neighbourhood, by which I mean, uh, you know, the Western Balkans, uh, relations with Russia, uh, and, and Central, uh, Central Europe and, and Eastern Europe, uh, North Africa, the Middle East. I mean, these are the areas which really have the potential to impact uh, seriously on our, 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 our own situation. Uh, and I think that is the area where we need to invest most. Of course, transatlantic relations are important. China is a very big issue and Africa is, is a huge issue. Uh, I think if Europe does not take a, a close interest in Africa, probably nobody else will, certainly not the United States, I think. So uh, I would put them in, in that kind of order, I, I think, but I think that the, the, the most important area is our immediate relation, is our immediate neighborhood. I, I didn't mention Turkey and I should have, of course, because it's, it's another very important player in, in that. I, I think, you know, we live in quite a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, and this is where we need to focus our attention and try to have the, the maximum impact. I mean, do you think there's a degree of complacency amongst member states about about some of these challenges? I mean, obviously, the world feels like a much more turbulent environment than it did sort of five, even ten years ago. I don't think there's any complacency, but I think there is a reluctance to really drive forward common positions. People are still very much locked in their traditional outlooks. So, you know, if you are closer to Russia, you are very, very concerned about Russia. If you're a bit further away, you're less concerned. <laughs> if you're in the front line of the, the migration waves, then you have one view about those issues. Uh, if you are further away, you feel less concerned and more able to take a, a, a less helpful view. Um, you know, if you're Italian, Libya is hugely important, but Libya is not necessarily a priority for say, Northern European countries. So I, I think that's, uh, we, we have not yet, matured to the point where we can take a true pan-European view of what's important and, and recognize that you know, Libya is important, not just because it counts for Italy, but because for Europe it counts. Uh, relations with Russia and how we deal with uh, a more aggressive and assertive Russia is a problem for all of us, even if you're pretty far to the West and you're not as close as, as Poland or the, or the Baltic States. And I, I don't think we've yet matured to the point that people are able to make that kind of association. Now, the, the example of Russia is very interesting because that was a, uh, uh, certainly in the last few years we've seen um, particularly the, the German Chancellor taking a lead there in terms of, you know, driving European policy. I mean, does it does it matter too much who is in the, if you like, who is in the lead in these kind of situations as long as somebody is? Or does, do you think that's a, a sort of symptom of the fact that the EU collectively cannot speak with a single voice on many issues? Well, I mean... I think it's very important to understand what the EU is. It is not a country. Uh, it's not even a federation. It's, it's possibly a confederation, but it's, it's, it's not a country. So I, I think we are not trying to build a, a single foreign policy. Uh, maybe we, we will have that 20 years from now, I don't know, but that's not where we are today. Uh, so we are necessarily trying to build common policies out of different starting points. And people still want the room to maneuver, to behave, you know, a bit separately and not always to be locked into a common position. You know, you can say that's a weakness and it, it probably is, but I think it's a weakness we have to live with. Uh, we are not trying to eliminate the members, the, the nation state. We're not trying to homogenize everyone into a single European entity. And this means there will be different approaches. I, I think what we need more of is still a, a, 
a greater recognition that what counts for one member state in the end is important for us all. And we need to be more willing to sort of look at what it means for certain countries. You take the recent conflicts with, with Turkey for Greece and Cyprus. Now you can agree or disagree on some of the substance, but these are, it's hugely important for those two countries. Uh, you know, you cannot, it, it's fine then to say, well, yeah, but we need to keep good relations with Turkey. But you know, at a certain moment, you have to decide whose side you're on, uh, equally with Russia. Uh, I, I think um, if you're in the Baltic states or you're in Poland, uh, you have a certain history with Russia. Uh, and you, you, you want reassurance that, uh, you know, people are aware of that. Uh, of course, we have economic issues with Russia. We ultimately have uh, the need probably to somehow get to a less confrontational space with Russia. But we have to bear in mind that for some, really, this is uh, almost an existential issue. Um, well, if we can sort of drill down then on some of the specifics of relationships that EU has with 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 countries in other parts of the world, so I'd like to sort of look first at the the EU's relationship with the United States. So you wrote a, a recent op-ed in the Irish Times about um, how the EU should deal with with the incoming Biden administration, and you said the EU should offer the Biden administration a new transatlantic deal. And I'm just wondering, what, what in your view, what should that consist of? And how can the EU and US kind of renew and, and reinvigorate the multilateral system more generally? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, in, in so many ways, the transatlantic relationship is absolutely crucial uh, for all our member states. Uh, I would also think it's fairly crucial for the US, but viewed slightly differently from their perspective. Um, this is true obviously in security terms. I mean, let us be frank, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in strategic autonomy. You want to come back to that later. Mm. But we need to be realistic about just how autonomous we can be militarily. Uh, at this point, we, we, we need the military alliance. We need that um, uh, umbrella of, of American uh, military uh, cover. Uh, and uh, it's certainly true economically that the transatlantic uh, economic corridor is the single most important economic corridor in the world, bar none. I mean, we, we, we are much more economically important to each other than either of us have any with any other partner, whether that's China or anyone. Um, but I think we need to understand that America is changing. Uh, there are structural changes, demographic changes. Um, there's a fatigue in the American body politic with uh, a sense of America has been over-engaged, uh, over-extended, uh, spending too much time looking after the rest of the world and not enough time looking after itself. And that's structural. That's Trump may have been a symptom of that, but he was not the driver of it. And Biden may take a slightly different view, but he still has to take into account that that, that is an important element in American politics. So I think we as Europeans need to uh, reinvent this relationship for the 21st century, which in my view, requires us as Europeans to be a stronger partner in that relationship, doing more, whether that's in, in, in security and defense, we can come back to that, whether that's in uh, a trade and, and um, uh, investment, uh, digital issues, tech regulation, taxation, so forth, and of course the issue of China, uh, which is huge for both of us. Uh, uh, and I think we need to establish a new equilibrium where the, the relationship remains crucially important, but where the Europeans shoulder a greater part of the responsibility and become a more equal partner. Not easy, uh, easy to say, less easy to do, but I think that's what, that's what we have to do. And, and that's the, we have, a, I think, a unique chance with this administration over the next few years uh, to re-engineer that relationship in, along those lines. So it's obviously you spent sort of five years in Washington as the EU's ambassador. So you obviously you, you, you saw the, the end, the last couple of years of the Obama administration and, and, and much of the Trump administration. I mean, obviously a, a great deal has been made about how uh, the Trump administration has seen the EU much more as a rival rather than necessarily kind of a friend, uh, sort of a friend and an and, and ally. I mean, but were the kind of seeds of that already there under the Obama administration? I mean, was there more continuity than perhaps we realised or was the Trump administration actually really as um, uh, sort of as, as, as much of a, of a rival as it did? Well, I think 
President Trump was elected on a platform of disruption and he disrupted and he disrupted you know, way beyond anything that uh, President Obama did. I, I think it is true to say that the, the structural changes in American society that sort of came to a head under Trump were present uh, under Obama. I mean, after all, it was President Obama who did the pivot to Asia. Uh, he was clearly the first Pacific president uh, uh, it was indicative of the changing demographic changes, uh, the, the changing demographic uh, trends in the United States, uh, and this sense, as I say, of the United States moving away from the um, enormous international engagement which had characterized American policy, you know, basically since 1945 and, and through to uh, the, the early 2000s. Uh, and I think this is a structural change that is irreversible. And that's what we have to understand as Europeans. That uh, So Trump made it worse and he was, you know, infinitely more aggressive. And he was the first American president, I think, in living memory uh, or ever, perhaps, who was directly hostile to the idea of the European Union and the idea of European integration. Uh, so that, that certainly made things worse. But... The main point is he was part of a trend which has been there in the past and which, in my view, is not going to be completely reversed by the arrival of President Biden, even if he has a completely different worldview. And so just briefly, then, in your personal experience of that in, in, in Washington, I mean, did you find then that it was actually it was difficult to get the, uh, the administration in general to listen to, to, to the EU position or to, 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 to take it on board? No, we didn't have any problems of, of access or people listening to us. They just didn't agree. <laughs> Uh, I mean, they just they just had a different a different worldview, uh, and this was very clear. Uh, so they withdrew from the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. They withdrew from the JCPOA with with Iran. Uh, you know, in, in, in later times, they withdrew from the WHO. Uh, they basically brought the WTO to a standstill. So I mean, these were all actions which were you know completely at odds with traditional U.S. policy uh, that we had to deal with, and it was not easy. But there will presumably, with the Biden administration, be a lot more willingness to try and sort of get those bits of mul the multilateral system working and operating effectively again. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, I think the tone and the style will change dramatically. I think there will be, you know, the good news is that uh, they have announced that they will rejoin the Paris climate deal. They will return to the table with Iran. We don't know exactly how that's going to work because meanwhile the Iranians have kind of uh, moved in the wrong direction. Um, uh, they will rejoin the WHO. I, I don't know what they will do on the WTO, frankly. I think trade uh, is, a, is another issue um, which may not be a high priority for this administration, at least in the first, uh, first year or so. Uh, so I, I think, yes, there will be a, a distinctly different a tone and approach. Uh, I think they will reaffirm their commitment to NATO and to alliances and to allies, because I think one, one of the, the worst features of, of President Trump is he almost seemed to treat his adversaries better than he treated his allies. And this was kind of very disconcerting, uh, not just for the Europeans, but for many in, in Asia. Uh, and hopefully that will be reversed. Can we turn to the other big global actor that the EU has to engage with, which is which is China, and obviously the relationship between the EU and China is quite is, is one of com complex interdependence, and um, I think uh, it's safe to say that the EU view collectively of the of China has become slightly more sceptical in recent uh, months. Um, but in other contexts, it's obviously quite cooperative and it remains in a kind of an essential relationship. So what approach should the EU be taking to China then in the short and longer term? How should we be trying to work together where we can? And, and, and what are the ways of kind of trying to influence and, and direct China in, sort of in, the, in the kind of directions we would hope it to go? Yeah, I mean, it's not easy to influence China. Let's be, let's be frank about that. I mean, um, I, I always take as my point of reference uh, Chris Patton's uh, line when he was European Commissioner for External Relations, having been, of course, uh, Governor General in, in Hong Kong, having written a, a very remarkable book about China. And Chris always used to say, uh, the only thing we should worry about more than a, a successful China would be an unsuccessful China. Uh, and I, I, I always think that that is, you know, what we have to bear in mind is China is a given. China is not going to go away. It's 1.4 billion people. Um, they have a system 
that we may not like, but which you know delivers in its own way on its own terms, um, which has many features that we would regret and, and even deeply disapprove of, but it's it's here to stay. It's back, um, and the question is how do we allow China to develop its international role while at the same time uh, not falling into the trap of, of accepting some of the values and the practices that, that China thinks are the right way to behave, whether that's uh, in terms of its domestic politics or in terms of uh, what, it, what it proposes elsewhere. Uh, and this is not easy. I think it requires a, a slight, slightly schizophrenic approach where we need to push back on the things we disagree about, but find ways to engage with China, whether that's on climate change or, or international issues like, like Iran. Um, I don't think that the policy pursued by Trump of confrontation, of almost trying to isolate or decouple China from the international uh, economic order uh, is a, a successful recipe. I, I don't think people say, oh, well, you know, one thing Trump did was he was right on China. He may have been right in identifying many of the things we don't like about China, but I think what he what he did in terms of his policies didn't succeed in the objective, which was to reduce China's influence. Uh, I, I think what we need to think, what we need to be aware of in the West is that China can probably decouple from us more quickly than we can decouple from China. Uh, you know, when you've got 1.4 billion people and you've got a relatively self-contained economic system you can survive uh, relative isolation uh, in ways that maybe the rest of us can. And it's not healthy that China would feel disconnected from the global order. So how do we get that balance between confrontation and, and, and uh, uh, being critical of the things we disagree about, and many of them are profound, whether that's their economic behavior, whether that's the human rights behavior or the, the, uh, the behavior in the region, uh, while at the same time, creating a space where China can see an interest in being a constructive member of the international community. And I, I don't think, I'm not saying that's easy. I, I've dealt a lot with China in, in, in my time and it's, you know, they are tough, tough uh, people to deal with. Uh, and what we don't really measure very accurately is what is Xi Jinping's real vision uh, for the future of China? I mean, is it global dominance, as some people say? Is it to, to become the America of the 21st century? Personally, I doubt that China could ever achieve that because it's, it's not a country, you know, America had unique attributes that enabled it to play that role. Uh, I don't think that China can play that role. Uh, but on the other hand, it's clear that um, Xi Jinping has a lot of ambition for China's Global, global role and we need to figure that out. And I think one of the things that will be important between the, the new Biden administration and the Europeans and like-minded countries like Japan, South Korea, will be to figure out how we approach China in a way that shows determination to be critical of the things we don't like, but which does not set up a kind of new cold war with China, which in my view would be uh, ultimately uh, self-defeating. I mean, one of the interesting things about how China relates to the EU and, and, and its member states is the fact that it, is, it has established quite, you know, strong political relationships with a number of states individually. And actually that seems to create a potential wedge between them and the kind of a more kind of collective EU position. I mean, how challenging is that then when you have individual states that seem to be attracted to China, and maybe looking out for their own interests versus the need to create a kind of a more common approach at EU level? Well, I mean, the Chinese are not unique in doing that, right? I mean, the Americans, the Americans have done it in the past. So, it, you know, it's, it's a very tempting thing for anyone looking at the EU to do uh, is to try to uh, divide member states. Um, I see the UK has been tempted to do that in Brexit, uh, perhaps with less success. Uh, so that's a, that's a reality we have to deal with, that um, we can never completely... Uh, exclude the fact that individual countries will have, you know, differing interactions with a, a big partner like, like China. Uh, I remain relatively confident that uh, while in the very short term, some countries may see a, an interest in pretending to be closer to China, um, people are relatively clear-eyed about, 
you know, what you get when you deal too closely with China, whether that's in the one belt, one road, um, the, the, the nature of the investments or the loans, the insistence on using uh, Chinese labor. Uh, uh, so um, I, I think people will, will in the end come around to understanding that, you know, being very, very close to China as part of a, a policy of somehow differentiating yourself from the rest of the EU is not in the end, really, in any country's interests. Mm. Um, you mentioned Brexit, so I'm going to I'm going to turn us to the, the to the question of the relationship between the EU and the UK. I'm not going to ask you to make a prediction about the outcome of the talks. You'll probably be pleased to hear. Um, but what I would like to ask is about the basis for 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 the relationship, particularly in foreign policy terms. It would seem to me that um, the UK and its, and its former EU partners re retain a lot of similar challenges. They have to deal with a lot of the sort of same kind of common issues and threats. Um, so, what would you say would be the basis for a kind of cooperative and collaborative relationship in foreign and security policy in the coming years? Is that is that are we going to see that emerging? Do you think? Look, I, I think that very much depends on, on the UK. Um, I, I've already said to you that I think, you know, one of the big losses of the UK uh, exit is in the area of foreign policy, defence policy, um, because I think the UK, you know, is a hugely important player, um, permanent member of the uh, Security Council, nuclear power, uh, one of the member states with global reach, uh, a serious, you know, one of the two or three most important uh, military assets. So all of those things are lost. I don't know, Nick, to be very frank, what this government wants for its future relationship with the EU. I think if it wanted a close uh, cooperation on those issues, the EU would be willing. Uh, my sense, unfortunately, uh, at this point in time, is that this current government has an extremely ideological view about anything that looks like cooperation with Europe. And they tend to have an allergic reaction against it. Uh, I mean, look at the fact that we can't apparently even agree on Erasmus, right? I mean, my God, you know, student and academic exchanges, and somehow this has become an issue of, of, of you know, fundamental disagreement. And I'm surprised frankly, uh, you know, very disappointed. But I, I, one of the things I thought when the UK left is that people in the UK would stop going on about the EU, right? I mean, you've left. So why do you have to spend your time talking about the EU? But unfortunately, it seems as though it remains, you know, the most important topic of conversation uh, uh, in the UK and, and not in a positive sense. So I'm not particularly optimistic in the short term. Uh, I, I would hope and assume, as you rightly say, that in the medium term, we do share very common uh, interests and very common values, and uh, we are probably closer to each other than, than any of us are to anybody else. Uh, so I hope that we can get back, you know, whatever the, the, the future relationship in terms of trading relationships and FTAs and so on, that on these fundamental issues, we can cooperate and find ways of cooperating. But I observed that when the EU proposed to this UK government uh, some kind of framework agreement on security and foreign policy, it was refused. I mean, we were told basically, no, we don't want that kind of relationship. We will work with individual countries. We want to be free to uh, go our own way. So I'm not terribly optimistic in, in the short term. Well, I'm just going to up put put one final question to you, if I may, and the kind of drawing drawing these various threads together. Um, so there's a great deal of discussion at the moment around the concept of European strategic autonomy. And there's something, for example, a recent interview by the German ambassador to France talked about, about this being, being an important new direction that the EU needed to go in. So I'm just wondering, if can you just explain to us what is European strategic autonomy in practice and what is actually required to achieve it? And is it a, quote unquote, is it a good thing? Well, I, I... I don't know if it's a good thing. I think it's a necessary thing. I mean, I, I think the idea is simply that Europe has to be better able to stand on its own two feet and take responsibility for its own actions and its own neighborhood and its own immediate environment. Um, that is not uh, to say that we don't want alliances. We don't, you know, I don't think it threatens NATO because I think NATO remains the, the cornerstone of security policy for 
most of our member states, I mean, I'm Irish, we're neutral. Uh, I'm not sure against whom we're neutral, but we're neutral, and there are other neutral states uh, in, in the EU. But for most of our member states, NATO remains the cornerstone of security policy. Um, and, and the American alliance, the transatlantic alliance is crucial. But you know, we, we, we cannot ignore the fact that we are faced with an America that is going to be less engaged. I mean, that's just a fact. Uh, and therefore, we have to ask ourselves, well, if the Americans aren't there, are, are we incapable of acting? Or do we as Europeans have our own view and do we have certain capabilities of, of action? And that applies in the security field, in defense, more cooperation. I mean, people talk about the 2% objective in NATO and not many European countries meet that. But when you add up the defense budgets of all our member states, we actually are the second largest defense budget in the world. <laughs> we're ahead of the Chinese and we're ahead of the, the Russians, we're behind the Americans, of course. But do we get value for that? Do we, do we actually, are, are the capabilities of our 27 uh, militaries uh, actually, you know, do they, do they add up to that sum of money? The answer is no. So can we do, you know, can we reduce the, 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 the multiplicity of weapon systems, of vehicles, the inefficiencies in our military, uh, in our, our national militaries? We're not talking about a European army. There's no NATO army. There doesn't need to be an EU army. But if you improve the ability of our respective national defense forces to be efficient, to cooperate together, to be interoperable, uh, in ways that they are not now. Uh, look at the issue of military mobility. I mean, you know, there's a major challenge, which is a NATO challenge, but also an EU challenge about moving military kit around Europe because our bridges and our roads are not necessarily adapted to it. So these are all common EU challenges that we could do together uh, in a way that would make us militarily more effective and more efficient have better deterrence towards potential aggressors, have certain capabilities of deploying troops if, if that were necessary, in, in perhaps in the neighborhood or in, in peacekeeping uh, operations, or even as we do in Mali, uh, in more, more aggressive operations. Uh, and I think this is necessary. Uh, you look at the effect of the secondary sanctions imposed by the, the US in relation to Iran. Uh, when the US left the, the JCPOA, uh, the Europeans wanted to preserve the, the agreement. The secondary sanctions imposed by the US effectively deprived Europe of any ability to have a foreign policy towards Iran, which was separate from the US. Is that a healthy situation? I don't think so. Uh, I think we need to be more able to, when we feel it's necessary, to maintain and, and implement uh, our own foreign policy uh, options. Uh, so, I mean, that's what this is about. It's not about uh, undermining the transatlantic alliance. I think the US can see an advantage uh, in having a stronger European uh, pillar of, of that relationship. Uh, I think NATO can see that. If you talk to, to the people in NATO, they would welcome a more effective and uh, uh, um, efficient European uh, military. Uh, so I, I think that's, where, that's what we're talking about. Um, I don't think that it is uh, a kind of binary choice between transatlantic and, and, and strategic autonomy. I think strategic autonomy can be an important component in strengthening the transatlantic relationship. And I think that's what most people want to try and achieve. David, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for answering my questions. Um, we're going to open it up now to our audience. So a number of you have already put some uh, some questions in the Q and A. Um, so I'm just going to sort of pull some of those up and then invite a couple of you to to put your questions directly to David.